So I'm slightly nervous. I'm Karen Pollock. I'm from a small village around three miles away from Fodo. So feel free to call me Karen Penny at any time. <laughs> I'm a counsellor, psychotherapist, and I'm queer. And it's that last word <coughs> that we're going to talk about today in Queering Shula. So the word queer is quite a contentious one and it has a lot of meanings that may be unfamiliar to people. I am about to run through queer theory in less than 10 minutes, which might seem mind-boggling, but brilliantly, there were two other speakers today, Carla, of course, and Peter, who are going to go into some of these themes. So if you don't get it, it's me. I'm going too fast. I'm rushing. You'll get it from them. They know what I'm doing. So queer, it can be an adjective. Like, that's a very queer thing to say. First of all, recorded use of queer in a publication is actually in the Sherlock Holmes story. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle used it to describe the corrupt policeman as being on Queer Street. And we, the, it's assumed the origins are Scottish for strange, odd, corrupt. Um, it's also a noun, and it's often quite a slur. He's one of those queers, or he's a queer. It's also an identity, and this is partly what I'm talking about today. It's a claimed identity by people who go, I am queer, it's something I'm proud of. I'm not going to read from what that says, but that used to be a slogan on Pride Marches. Um, it's also a verb. That's the other aspect of what we're talking about today. When you queer something, you make it into something where queer people, LGBTQ people, see themselves in literature where they haven't previously been included. As in, in queer and Jane Austen, Cedric offended just about anyone. And, and she did. <coughs> More recently, it's also become an identity, as in, it's just another word for LGBT. The BBC did queer in Britain for the 50th um, anniversary of the decriminalisation of homosexuality. So it's a strange word, it has lots of meanings. I'm generally talking today about it being a verb and a claimed identity. So a lot of theorists have talked about queer and things. And what they're talking about is going against the normal, going against the accepted. Michael Warner, in the book The Trouble of Normal, says, We queer things when we resist the issues of the normal. The normal to have ideals of aspiring to be normal. In identity, behaviour, appearance. I wrote an essay recently that queer is in a world of easy listening to elevator music. It's an active world. Bound up with how you interact with the world. Michael Foucault was a French philosopher and gay and pretty much the most famous queer theorist. When he went to San Francisco, he said, I am no longer homosexual, I am gay. What he was trying to say there was he didn't have a medical identity, he had a claimed identity that went against fitting in with the world. It's a resistance to monolithic categories and a resistance. <laughs> it's a resistance to wanting to fit in, which can be quite shocking because most of us want to fit in. Queer says, what if I don't want to be like you? And queer things as a genre, genre says, who are the people who we can say are doing things differently, who don't want to be normative? who perhaps want to challenge the status quo. And I've already mentioned Eve Sedgwick. Queers, the possibilities, the gaps, the overlaps, the dissonances and the resonances, the lapses and excesses of meaning when the constitute elements of anyone's gender, of anyone's sexuality, aren't made or can't be made to signify monolithically. She's basically saying queer is something about those who don't fit in. What are we talking about not fitting into? We're talking about not fitting into heteronormativity. Heteronormativity is mummy, daddy, and two children, everything's wonderful, the world is perfect. We know it's not perfect, but it's the picture we are told from very young of how everyone is. Miriam Webster defined heteronormativity as the attitude that it's normal and natural. Again, back to that idea there's one category we should all fit into. A huge part of heteronormativity is the relationship escalator. 
Now this is an interesting concept because most of us have never even thought about it. It's anything but what everyone does. So it's first date, then sex, then living together, then get engaged, then get married, then die. Except already, I described a relationship escalator that didn't exist 50 years ago. The relationship escalator is sold to us as this is what everyone does. But it's changed completely from something my grandmother would have So instead of it being a norm, it's something that's imposed and we're expected to take on as a norm. I describe it as the scaffolding which holds heteronormativity. You must meet a man, you must get married, you must have children. And we're not ever meant to question that. Which brings me to, why do we need to queer Shuler? Because the history of queerness is a history of claiming overlooked spaces. It's the saunas, it's the bus stations, it's Hampstead Heath. It's spaces which people weren't policing or were turning a blind eye to that queer people could go, we're going to take this. We have to do this with characters when we don't see ourselves reflected in art, literature, music, TV, film or radio soap operas. Now some people would say that you have Adam and Ian. I've got to be careful here because I know someone else is talk <laughs> talking about Adam and Ian later. But Adam and Ian, there's two really interesting things about them. If I swapped either for a different gender, so made Adam a woman or Ian a woman, you could keep every single plot. They are homosexual, they are not gay. Going back to the Foucault quote. There is nothing about them that says that their identity as gay men is reflected in the show or matters to them. <laughs> I'm not sure what to put this in, but I'm going to ask me what it means afterwards if you don't know. It really worries me that I don't know between Adam and Ian which one tops and which one bottoms. <laughs> I should know that if they were clear representations of gay men. So let's look at Shula. She's left a relationship rather than stay on the escalator. She's, she's refused to stay with that should, with that heteronormativity that it's date, sex, engage, marriage, die. She faced family rejection for being her th authentic self. We've had it this week with Jim. Jim has basically said you should have stayed in an unhappy marriage. You should have not been authentic. And this is something LGBT slash queer people often hear. Why are you shoving it down our throats? Why, why do you have to have a pride march? Why do you have to be yourself? Why can't you just stay hidden and unhappy and in the closet? When Shula left Alistair, she came out of a closet. Um, she's rejected the conventional narrative for her gender. Jill, who, whoever's starting the I Hate Jill fan club. Yeah. <laughs> Jill directly told her that's what women do. Yeah. Women put up with unhappiness. And Shula resisted that. She was like, no. I'm going to follow my heart, and her heart in this situation was, I'm going to leave Alistair. Then we have the concept of queer time. Queer time is a really interesting thing. Usually, when most people in their um, teenage years, and someone's already mentioned Erickson, it, it, it's when you do identity formation, you start dating, you work out what you like, what you want to do, who you are. A lot of queer people in that period are like, ah! <laughs> it gets delayed. So that doesn't really start till your 20s. Everything gets slower. Everything might be more flexible, more fluid. I sometimes describe queer time like getting the steps at Covent Garden tube station instead of going up in the lift. <laughs> it's longer, it's slower, it takes you much more time to get to the top. Arlene Lev, who is um, one of the biggest, theory, biggest researchers on transgender theory, and she wrote the coming out model for trans people. And an awful lot of what she found was that trans people delayed coming out to their children who'd grown up because they didn't want to hurt their children by being their authentic self. So they remained closeted, often struggling with mental ill health, as we saw with Shula, 
for the sake of the children and then would come out in their 40s, 50s and 60s. So, I am not saying that Sheila was a transmasculine demi boy. <laughs> I, am say, I am saying she could be. But most of all, I'm saying, why do I have to write her as that? Why do I even have to think of her as that? Queering characters is a speculative fiction queer people create to see themselves. If we are not seeing ourselves in the archers, then something has gone wrong. This is from the Queer Nation Manifesto. ACT UP were an organisation in 1990 when AIDS was at its height and the American government was basically refusing to fund any treatment, any research. They were leaving people to die. So <laughs> Queer Nation were, ACT UP were very angry and they produced this manifesto. Being queer means leading a different sort of life. It's not about the mainstream profit margins, patriotism or patriarchy or being assimilated. It's not about executive directors, privilege and elitism. It's about being on the margins, defining ourselves. What is Shula doing but defining herself? There's my contact details. Big shout out to the Pink Therapy Group. Anyone else is a counselor or a psychotherapist? Join our group. Yes. <laughs> so it's time for just a couple of questions. Over here, over here, and then we go back there. Catherine, is your mic Do you want to say it and we can just repeat the question yeah, yeah. from here? It's more of a stab than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is more of a comic. Yeah. It's a stab and a bit of a joke. I remember in uh, Donald, when Donald Trump was um, campaigning to be elected, and uh, he was decided that he would campaign for the LGBT vote. So he turns to the altar queue and starts reading L G B. T. And quite clearly, that man had never used those letters in that particular order in his life. So the only reason I'm less keen on queering is I want this to keep on adding more and more letters to make it harder and harder. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine Brian saying all of those letters as well? Fantastic. I think, I think Brian is definitely someone who would talk about a queer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I take you back to this slide that you showed me? Okay. The last one. How does Shula reject the conventional narrative? <laughs> she should have. Oh, a bit challenging. Question. No, no, no. no just, no. just what Jill said. I mean, she should have stayed married. She should have put herself. You know, women sacrifice themselves. Sorry, I might sound like a feminist here. <laughs> <laughs> women are meant to sacrifice God themselves forbid. for the husband and the children. And Jill was. So you unhappy? So what? That's what women do. Mm. That's going to have to be the last one. Having had the same upbringing, I'm remembering that for a long time Kenton was written as going to be gay. Yeah. Uh, has that had an effect, do you think, of the way that we see Shula? I, I, yeah, I mean, didn't even have time to mention Charlie Thomas either. Mm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think they got scared mm. because he was such a central character and then they rewrote him as Adam. That, that's my personal theory. But Adam, Kenton had the whole. We saw him from childhood, we saw the sort of queerness or the gayness, whatever you want to call it, woven in. And Adam just went, oh, I like men now. That was brilliant.